um, the Kuwait Fellow at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies and the lecturer in Islamic Studies at the Faculty of Theology, Oxford University's oldest faculty. He is the first ever Malaysian to be appointed to such a position in this world famous university. His areas of expertise are Islamic theology, law, and science. Lot Afifi, who comes from Malaysia, was or educated originally at the feet of the ulama and of the Muslim world. From 2018 to 2020, he was appointed by the Conference of Rulers as Deputy Chairman to the High Level Panel on the Federal Administration of Islam, a Royal Commission looking into um, institution reforms of the Islamic religious establishment of, at the federal level in Malaysia. Since 2010, Dr. Afifi has been listed in the, Mus uh, the Muslim 500, the world's 500 most influential Muslims. So Dr. Afifi's talk today is titled Islam, the Malay Nusantara and the Rule of Law. The talk will go for about 45 minutes and then there'll be a 30 minute Q&A session at the end, inshallah. Thank you, Daini. Uh, as a student of Oxford, actually, well, you see, you run away already. So I, so I thought this is going to be like a tutorial. <laughs> And uh, it's, I was going to wait for your questions, really, before I can even start. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm very, very pleased and, in fact, honoured and surprised that the uh, proprietor uh, had asked, did you know uh, Sayyid Abdurrahman uh, Junaid? No. Did you know that she is a student, actually, no. of ours in, in Oxford? No. So is that the reason why you asked her to, uh, to chair tonight's... Uh, no. Alhamdulillah. So this is the reverse, uh, the reverse experience. So normally the tutor does the tutorial, the student now does the tutorial. Alhamdulillah. Well, very pleased to meet you. And, and, and if, is it okay for me to announce? I think it's official now, right? Mm -hmm. So Dayini is just finished with her BA in Arabic uh, at Oxford with her first class degree, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, so. So I'm sure your parents will be very proud and we're all very proud of you, inshallah. And later we can speak about what your future plans are, inshallah. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulhi al-kareem. Uh, indeed, uh, Daini, uh, Sayyid uh, Abdurrahman al-Junaid, Sayyid Abdul Qadir al-Haddad, and Sayyid Abdullah al-Haddad, see all this Ba'alawi Hadrami Mafia is here. And, and this is the real royal family, by the way. And, and to the rest of the Marheen, the rest of the, the common folk, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It, it really is um, my pleasure to be here this evening. I, I'm actually not well in the sense that I'm a bit under the weather. Orang Melayu kata demam sikit, tapi tak ada demam. I don't know what that means. You know, so, a bit of a <clears throat> so I have a bit of a cold, I think. Uh, it's rare to have a cold in Malaysia, I think, you know, in a country where it is, it is quite um, uh, a temperate, I mean, tropical weather, alhamdulillah. Um, but uh, it must be partly also because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me by sending, uh, sending me away from very, very hot Europe to very temperate weather as a change in, in Southeast Asia, in the Nusantara. In fact, when I had the invitation by the Sahib al mukha to speak, I, you know, I, I, I said, I, you know, what do you want me to speak on? And he mumbled, mumbled about, you know, so you have Islam and something on the Nusantara, Malay, something like that. And then I said, okay. And maybe because of the, partly in Malaysia, those of you who caught the political bug known as the local elections. So I thought it would be very good to put in a bit there. We have a bit, a bit of a sting on the rule of law, you know, just to add to the mix. And, and hence, our tutorial this evening really is on Islam, the Nusantara, the Malay Nusantara, which is the region, Southeast Asia, which is, alhamdulillah, we've kind of been spared the extreme hot weather, subhanAllah, that is actually um, uh, facing Europe now, you know, and, and, and Britain. And of course, we, we look at the rule of law and uh, it, it's it's interesting because I you know, I won't speak for 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 long I think as I said I'm a bit under the weather but I think it would be great to have more interaction uh, here and so this is just as a start uh, the Oxford system is um, as Daini would confirm is is although in your faculty in in what used to be called the Oriental Studies faculty and hence they produce Orientalists Mustafa Kun. Um, now they've changed it for the first time to a more politically correct name, I think, Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. 
uh, which is the name, the same name of the faculty given in the other place, which is the University of Cambridge. And so you know the the Sunnah and Adab of those in Oxford. They always like to refer to the other place as in the other place, Makan Acha. So maybe and whenever people actually talk about when they, they come across you if you are doing your Hajj, but alhamdulillah less so when you do your Hajj or your Umrah, but particularly in Europe, when they come across Malaysians, you know they always mention the other place, Singapore. So uh, and 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 always they sometimes mention this to Malaysians. They have travelled almost all you know all of the world, north, south, east, west. And I notice that people actually have that sting whenever they come across Malaysians. They always have to mention Singapore as if we fail and Singapore has succeeded, or vice versa. You know, so whenever that happens, I always say, oh, it's, it's healthy competition. Musabaka bil khair. It's a bit like Oxford and Cambridge. You know, Singapore and, and Malaysia in that sense, although we are quite far behind in, in many respects. But um, this is one of the interesting things that. In, in Oxford itself, they've changed the, the faculty, which is a politically incorrect term nowadays, Oriental Studies. This is the place where we are trained to, even if you're not a Muslim, you know, seriously, you're not a Muslim and you study Islam. So that's why I asked Daini, what are you doing coming to do Islamic studies in Oxford? Don't come there. You, you should be going to Al Azhar or the Korowin, right? Remember, I, I, I gave your father that advice. I said, don't, they don't come. Yet she still applied and went through the process. But seriously, I mean, people who want to do Islamic studies, they really should sit under the, the guidance of the ulama, <coughs> our to gurus and our uh, pakiyais and you know scholars, uh, you know, at Al Azhar or at the Korowin. These are the real places where you actually really do Islamic studies with proper sanad. And then only later on, you know, once you've actually have your your proper guidance, so to speak, then. You know, you come to places like Oxford where you sit in the Oriental Institute and you study or you spar, you compete with the Mustashri Kun, with the Orientalists there. And that makes you, and if you really want to be able to spar, you know, like if you, if, if you play fencing, compete, you know, you, you then should have the intention to be a Mustashri you know. If they have the Mustashri Kun, the Orientalists, then we become Occidentalists. Those who study the West and the foundations of the West and the languages of the West, so that then you are able to kind of engage with them on an equal scholastic basis as well, not only throwing mud at, at, at our enemies, you know, using argumentum ad hominem. Just you know, if you've got nothing else left, then you just go personal, right? So may Allah subhanahu wa taala keep us away from that maqam, inshallah, and that may Allah keep us always on the straight path through through ilm. Uh, that, that will liberate us, you know, give us, give us freedom, inshallah, in our life. So, Islam, the Malay Nusantara, and the rule of law. And if you ask me what is the common denominator, I mean, I'm not going to make this into a tutorial now. I mean, they have never given a tutorial one to you, to, to ones to you directly. But if I were to ask you what is the common ground then between Islam, the Malay Nusantara, and the rule of law, what would you say? So we have to see how quick-witted the Oxford student can be. Yeah, that's right. um, to be honest, I'm not sure, but it, what rings the bell is that when Dr. Yaqub came to Malaysia some time ago and had a um, talk with Cassis, and I think what he talked about was how, you know, how, like, I think Johor was the first um, state to have a constitution. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of Orientalist historians have tended to say that they borrowed actually from the British Constitution, but what mm -hmm. maybe Dr. Yogan and other historians have said that it's actually borrowed from the um, Ottoman. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I mean, that's obviously later period, maybe like 19th, 20th centuries, but mm -hmm. I guess that's common denominator, perhaps. Thank you. Good. Interesting. So you've picked up an example from Johor. Uh, where, in fact, the very, one of the very earliest constitutions, written law, that was actually, you know, written out, and and of course, you know, we can give other examples. Of course, you know, I mean, I'm not Johorian, so if I'm kind of Chaluk Perakian in that sense. So I can say the Daundang uh, Simrapus Milan or something like that. You know, people always like to say that. But it's interesting, and I th thank you for this, Daini. It's interesting if we do reflect on this, and I think those of us who come from the region, this region is called Nusantara, um, the Malay archipelago, really, and that's why I've titled the, 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 the theme as the Malay Nusantara as well. Um, there is a very long tradition already in 
in the Nusantaran tradition of following the rule of law, which is interesting. We sometimes don't think about it um, in those terms. And when we say follow the rule of law, in Malay, the word is something that we come across in our Rukun Negara in Malaysia. This is our national philosophy, kedaulatan undang-undang, to uphold the rule of law, to uphold the, the sanctity of the law. And I have to say, again, I'm sorry to make the Orientalist the bad guy here, but it, you know, it's... Or generally in the West, even, not just the Orientalists. I mean, they, they, uh, they always pride themselves of the rule of law, particularly those of us who come from Britain. Hey, I'm from Britain as well, so we've lived there for 30 years now, so 20 years plus. So, I mean, this is the land, and when we talk about the rule of law, people always remember, and I hope you all know your history, right? The Magna Carta, right? The Magna Carta is a very important event in the history of mankind, of humankind. It happened in the year 1215, in the 13th century, and it was really a time when today, anybody coming from the West, they are very proud of this. I mean, particularly those from Britain, they say they created or invented the whole idea of the, following the rule of law, Kedaulatan Undaunda. This is a very British thing. To be civilized means you follow laws and you know, look at those Malaysians, you know, they're they are crooked there, they are kind of uh, you know, bending the law now. Is, you know, people who should be in jail are not in jail and so on and so forth. People who should be charged are not charged. And so so the idea of the rule of law, and particularly if you come from the Western perspective, you think this is a very foundational human thing. I mean, if you, like myself, I mean, I like reading a lot of fiction, particularly science fiction, and watch as well, you know, say Star Trek, for example. Uh, so in the case of Star Trek, you have, you have this example of, what is it, I don't know, do you watch Star Trek, Daini? No, sorry. It's the poorer you are, I think, yes. You know, the idea of follow, you know, following the United Federation of Planets, and then you have these, I forgot, the, the prime directive, you know. You can't break the prime, you know, that's like the law that you can't break. So this whole idea comes from this thing in the Western mind, from that event that happened in 1215, called the Magna Carta, right? And the Magna Carta is from the Latin word, phrase, which means the great uh, agreement, the major agreement, the, the, the important agreement, really. Um, and, and, you know, and this happened during the time of King John, so he was the younger brother of King Richard the Lionheart, the famous Richard I, who actually went to the Crusades and obviously fought with the famous Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, also known as Saladin. And you know, the rest is, as you know, his history, you know that. So, he, so, so King Richard the Lionheart was a very famous English king because he was a king that people see as a king who was fair and a, and a king who, who was the epitome of just rule. Who you know? Who was you know? In their eyes, although he wasn't really, because he didn't really spend a lot of time in England. By the way, he spent a lot more time outside, particularly in France, fighting, but especially in the Holy Lands during the Crusade, the Perang Salib, right? In the Malay is called Perang Salib, for example. So, but he he was the epitome of a just ruler. Whereas, after he died, King Richard, King John, because he never had any children, so he was busy fighting. So King John, John, his brother, succeeded him. And by the way, I happen to be a fellow of Worcester College, Oxford, and you know, Oxford students ought to know this. If you don't know this, this is one of the upmanship. You know, we have thirty-eight colleges in Oxford. Which is your college, Danny? Um, it was St John's. St John's well, is very, very rich college. You know, which is up the road, and they have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of money. It's a poor college. But one of the things that Worcester College is famous for is being the place where King Richard the Lionheart and King John basically were born. So this is, you know, that's why we call that the Bourbon Palace. This is the, the, the children of Henry the, the Second or something like that, or maybe Henry the First. I may have got the numbers uh, mixed up there. But John, on the other hand, who succeeded Richard the Lionheart, was not a just king. He was an unjust king. He was the sort of sultan or king in the stories of the Kesultanan Melayu Melaka, particularly 
I've forgotten the name of it, Sultan Mahmud. Uh, one of you can help me out. Who would rape the the daughter of someone, some orang besar, who would take other people's wives to bed, you know. And so clearly breaking all the rules of law that you can think of, you know. So King King John was like that. He he was the almost the opposite of King Richard. So, you know, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. It's God works in mysterious ways. It's amazing. It's just this one family, you have brothers, one who was the opposite of the other, Adil and Zalim, which is interesting. And because King John was so badly behaved, he was not the epitome of justice, he was the epitome of Zalim, of unjust rule. The barons, the orang orang besar, the barons, the dukes, you know, of the realm, rebel. So this is like, if you don't understand, uh, it's like King Arthur. King Arthur is the famous English king, mythical king, right? Not King, king Arthur, King Arthur. So King Arthur and the Round Table, it's like all the knights of the King Arthur rebel against the king. So King John had his own Round Table and his knights rebel against him. And that was called the Barons' War in the history of England. And it led to King John lost that war. So unlike the case of King Charles I, hundreds of, hundreds of years later, when there was also a civil war in England, rather than executing the king, they spared King John, but with the condition that King John has to sign a contract to say from now on he's going to behave and follow the rule of law. So this is the birth of the Magna Carta. This is how the Magna Carta was born in the West. And today, whether you are British, you are American, people who think they rule the world, they, they go back to this. They say, we are civilized because of this. They're very proud of this. Which is, it's a good thing, by the way. It's a civilizing thing. It's a very good thing. But what people sometimes don't realize, and I think thank uh, Sayyid Abdul Rahman now for, for inviting me here, because only because this is election season in Malaysia, I've added, you know, I said, maybe put in the rule of law there. Otherwise, it would just be a boring thing on Islam and the Malay Nusantara. There's a rule of law bit there. There's a bit of politics into this, you know, a bit of governance. What people don't sometimes realize is that actually the Nusantara, this region, the Malays who, who originally live in this region, actually have a very long history of what Dayini just said, you know. An example of that, the history of constitutionalism, of following the rule of law, and then and even writing it down. But the way the Malays write things down is that, like some of the Arabs in the old days, is that they memorize things. You don't necessarily, you know, because it's not a literate culture, it is an oral culture. So you memorize things. So did you know? You know, sometimes things that we take for granted today, especially among the Malays, is actually the basis of our constitutionalism. So, the monarchy here, for example, the royal families here, for example, they are so much into this philosophy, or at least they ought to be, if not, they need to be reminded of this, you know, meaning that this constitutionalism, it's part of our DNA. It's amazing. Have you heard of this Malay saying, which is nice, Raja Adil Raja Disambah, Raja Zalim Raja Disangah. I mean, if you translate this into English, it means the just ruler, the just king like King Richard the Lionheart just now, is a king that is worthy for us to swear our fealty and support and be loyal to. Raja Zalim Raja Disangah. But a ruler, a king who is unjust, like King John, his younger brother, then if you are unjust as a ruler, you break the laws, for example, then you are only worthy to not to be followed. I don't really, and you know, you need to help me out here, folks, you know, my Malay is particularly karat. The sangha can even mean, you know, executed, from what I understand, or that you basically pulau, or you basically ignore, basically you don't sambah, for example. So you, you know, so you when you meet a Malay king and you do this, this thing, so, yeah, so you don't you don't, you don't you don't swear your fealty basically. This is a very old, ancient Malay saying. And do you know where this comes from? This is interesting. This this if you think about it, this is basically our Magna Carta. 
This is basically the regions, the Nusantaran version of the Magna Carta. And it comes from one of you know, our Karya Agung, one of the great works of the Malay literature, or in fact history, called Sejarah Melayu, you know, Tun Sri Lanang, uh, who wrote it in the year 1615, or thereabouts, in the 17th century. And, and it tells the story of how the king, it basically, uh, Sang Sapurba, who's descended from the, you know, not, I almost said Aristotelian line, sorry, you can, you can tell how Aristotelian I am, sorry, from the Alexandrian line, you know, from, the, you know, this is, the, you know, this is the, the, the origins, myth origins, or if you don't want to say myth, but certainly, you know, the, the, the origin story of how, you know, particularly not just in, in Asia, not just in Southeast Asia, but in India generally, in South Asia generally, that Iskandar Zulkarnain, right? Alexander the Great has always been seen as this, this, this great ruler that people always want to impute their ancestorship back to him so that, you know, it's like you're connected to King Arthur of Camelot sort of thing, you know, for the English. So, Sang Sapurba is descended apparently from Alexander the Great, who arrived in Sumatra, and then met with Demang Lebadaun, who was one of the barons of Sumatra, one of the Orang Besar, one of the, the chiefs, representing the Rakyat there, representing the, the common folk there. And they made a pact, basically. And this is in Sejarah Melayu, it's all recorded there, which is very interesting. And they made the pact, that this, this is the pact. Pretty much, Raja Adil, Raja Disambar, Raja Zalim, Raja Disambar. So if you if you're gonna you're gonna be king, you need to make sure that you also take care of the interests of the people. So this is the social contract, right? And it's interesting in the Sejarah Malayu itself. It goes on to say, this is the I think the word they use akad, you know, or akad. You know, in 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 the Jawi, of course, it's from the Arabic akad, which means what? Akad is a contract, not just huh? for the Malays, huh? akad nikah. Yeah? I mean, seriously, this, this, you have Akad Tijar, you have a business contract. This is Akad Siyasi, the Akad Watan, the Akad for the country, a social contract for the country. So in that social contract, this Jaram Melayu records that Sang Sapurba and Demang Lebadaun made this oath of fealty. Demang Lebadaun made the oath of fealty. Raja Adil, Raja Disambah, so long as you are Adil. But if you're not Adil, then we're not going to have, you know, we're not going to be loyal to you, basically. So, folks, Hadirin wa Hadirat Sekalian, Rahmanullah, what is this? This is actually the basis of the Magna Carta. This is really the Magna Carta of the region, at least in written evidence. And in fact, around the same period, another word, another kalam, another, not pre Bahasa, I suppose today it has become like a, what's pre Bahasa Daini in Malay? Proverb, thank you very much, yeah. You know, Biar mati anak jangan mati adat. Literally, if you translate this into English, let the son or child die, or the daughter die, but not the adat. Literally. And there are those of us, especially among politicians today, maybe, and those who Malays who basically have lupa daratan or forgotten themselves. I mean, at least I'm based in Oxford, I, I hope, pray to God always, never loop a daratan. May Allah forgive me for being so far from my watan, from my homeland, from my motherland, from my fatherland. Uh, that, the, you know, so there are some who basically even sanggah this thing, right? Dismiss this thing. Oh, geez, look at these Malays. They've got fanatical, fanatical, fanatical followers of their adat, meaning they think adat means adat perpate, like how to get married and how you bersanding and how... You know, just customs and rituals, basically. Whereas, what they forget, people who say this, the meaning, biar mati anak jangan mati adat, let the child die, but not the adat. Adat here does not actually just mean customs and rituals. Adat comes, as Daini can confirm, first class Arab is from Oxford now. Means what? It means law. al adat muhakkama. Right? The fifth, universal legal maxim that all form adahib of Islam among the Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Shafi'is, the Hanafis, the Malikis, and the Hanbalis agree on the fifth. This is among the Qawai Kulliyah, Al-Adatu Muhakkamah, that, no, that norms of society, adah, or if you like laws, norms of society 
becomes a basis for legislation. It becomes a basis for legislation. So our law, the Sharia for the Muslims, do not only come from the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kalamullah, nor does it come only from the Sunnah, the perfect example of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa which is both Zahir and Batin, by the way. Sometimes our some of our misguided brothers only think the Zahir. <laughs> Remember, there is mafhum as well, Sunnah Mustanbita or Bida Hasana. That's another topic altogether, but Sunnah Mustanbita, a derived Sunnah. But in Ijma, the third source of the Sharia, which is also canonical, also authoritative, which is consensus, this is, this is precisely what we're talking about, the Ijma, which can come and can come from sources like Ada, for example, norms of society, and Qiyas, common sense. These are the four, what Christians would say canonical, what we say authoritative, sources of the Sharia, which are agreed upon by the ulama and the fuqaha, meaning the four madahib agree on this. The first two are scriptural sources, written sources, the last two are the non-scriptural sources. And then there are seven others that are disagreed upon by our ulama. Imagine that, there are 11 in total. There is Uruf, which is this, Ada, right? Number five. Number five is Uruf, Ada. Norms of society, cultural thing. You know, there is uh, Madhabu Sahabi, there's Istihsan, there's Istisla or Masalik Mursala. You know, there is Istisha, presumption of continuity. There is Sharab in Qablina, and so on and so forth, you right? And then Sadhu Tarani, preventative measure. So there's 11, you know. That's where the law comes from, really, not just Quran and Sunnah. Don't forget that. And this is what makes Islamic law, the legal tradition, so, mashallah, rich that the West, later on, borrowed a lot of it, including things which we ourselves do not follow in our jury trial in the Maliki Madhab, for example. The jury trial which is so famously made in America today from all your O.J. Simpson trial and whatever other trials. You know, jury trial, not just Hakim trial, jury trial. SubhanAllah. So, so this is the, the beauty of our tradition, that you see that the, the, the expansive tradition in that sense. It, it, it grows, it's an organic tradition. It's not something that you actually just see in the books. It's a living tradition. So that's why when we find this Malay saying, biar mati anak, jangan mati adat. Adat does not mean culture only. Even though adat, culture, is important. There are now some, certainly misguided Muslims, I'm sorry to say Ajalan Sasad, you could say that. You know, there are Muslims who even, one of my friends, um, Tim Winter, Shaykh Abdul Hakim, doing what I'm doing in Oxford, he in Cambridge, you know, used this term, acculturation. There are, there are some Muslims who go to some places in the Muslim world who acculturate, who try to destroy the local culture. The local culture, which has nothing wrong, and it doesn't go against the Sharia. But say, oh no, this is, this is not Islamic. Just in the name of that, the cases where, when, you know, after the end of the Bosnian War, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in those days, you know, a certain country would go there, and then Malaysia, by the way, was also involved in the reconstruction of Bosnia, alhamdulillah. And if you have any good Bosnian friends, they will tell you, they will love Malaysians because they see that Malaysians, when they rebuild their mosque, they build the mosque again back like what it used to be. A beautiful mosque with all the taswinat, and then you have the sign of Allah and Muhammad, and in the Ottoman tradition, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, and even sometimes Hussein and Hassan and Hussein. But a certain country going to that, you know, uh, country in Bosnia, so what they do is they whitewash the mosque instead. You know, whitewash the mosque is a term that is used in the history of religion, in Protestant, particularly in the Christian tradition, you know, when they fight between the Protestant and Catholic. They make the mosque like, oh, I'm not seeing this is a mosque. You know, before it was beautiful with all ornamentation, tazween, you know, decoration, Allah Muhammad. Everything is now white. Left the poor. Otherwise, if it's not Allah Muhammad, it's shirk or something like that. This is what Shaykh Abdul Hakim Murad in Cambridge say, it's acculturation. You have no, you know, you, 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 become, you, become, you become fearful of the culture. Actually, and you replace it with something actually more what my Sultan, His Royal Highness Tonku Sultan, I think, called Desert Islam, you know, you know like that. You know, it's the fifth source of our Sharia. Quran, Sunnah, or Hadith, Ijma, Qiyas, Ada, Uru. Why do I say this? Because this is an amazing saying of one of our Sultan. This is a saying that is attributed to Sultan Iskandar the Young of Aceh. Sultan Iskandar Muda. I forgot the dates of his death. He, I think he died again around the time of Tun Sri Lanang, 
16 something. In fact, he was the Sultan of Aceh who wrote to King James I. King James I of England was famous in England for being the, the, the king who promulgated the English Bible. He made the Vulgate Bible. He made the King James Bible. Basically like the DPP version of the Bible, you know, authorized English say, you know, this is, and until today, this is like the King's English Bible. Uh, they say, when they say the King's English, it's actually, that is what is meant. Uh, and so, and in fact, Sultan Iskandar Muda wrote to King James I. So I don't know whether you had the chance to check the Bodleian Library or not, Daini. And there is a letter written by Iskandar Muda to King James I, still preserved in our library in Oxford. You haven't seen that yet? No, I haven't. Oh, you either. have to come back. And then there, it's too late now. You've just finished your BA, so you have to maybe come back for a master's or something. And, and check the Bodleian Library. There's a letter dating back to 1612 or something like that. Amazing. So this is the Sultan who basically gave word to Biya mati anak jangan mati adat. Why? Apparently, when his son, it is said, committed a crime that required the death penalty, and one of his menteries or orang besar or his bendahara was afraid to go to see the king, you know, you know, Ananda has committed a crime and, and then you know the yes man syndrome in courts, you know, especially, you know, you can see this in all this Netflix nowadays, you know, the, the Korean movies, the Chinese and the Japanese kind of all the, the king movies and the emperor movies. The yes man syndrome, yes, 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 you know, but if you are yes man syndrome, if you are advising the king, then you are afraid to speak the truth. And then the sultan said, come on, come out with it, what is it that you want to say? Oh, uh, your son had committed a crime that is of death penalty. And he said, Bia mati ana, jangan mati ada. Let the child die, but not the law. This is the original Asbabul Burud. Oh, you know. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Those, 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 those who don't understand, this is the original context behind why, not this, this hadith was narrated, but this is the original context in which this Paribasa, right? This pro this has become Paribasa. Paribasa makes it sound very antiquated. People, you know, it's no longer an aphorism. Bukan hikmah. Bukan hikmah. Bukan hikam anymore. It's Paribasa. Olama Paribasa dah jadi macam, you know, you gather dust as a result. Oh my God, our great saying of the Mana Karta. This is a usul. It's a kaedah. Biar mati anak, jangan mati anak. It's not a Paribasa. Sorry. It is a kaida. Min kawaidina. Kulia even. Among the universal kaida. Among the wonderful legal maxim. Let our family die even if we have to uphold the rule. Where is this coming from? Subhanallah. Ya ayyuhalladina manu. Kunu kawamina bil qist. Shuhada alillah. Walau. You know. Al-Walidain uh, Al-Aqrabin It's from Surah Nisa Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say what? You know Oh you who believe One of the few verses in the Quran That, that Allah addresses You know Those who you know Believe what? Stand up to the truth Qawamina <laughs> Bilqis Speak up for justice basically Uphold justice As witnesses to God Shuhada <laughs> alillah Even if it is against your parents and those who are close to you, your relatives. This is a Quranic thing. So Sultan Iskandar Muda was not, this is not his saying. In fact, I can give you, so that was just now the Asbabu Nuzul, right? This is the Asbabu Wurud, jokingly speaking, aside. Sultan Iskandar Muda was actually following the hadith of Urwa from the Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim, right? When the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam narrated by Urwa said that what, you know, لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد سرقت لقطع تيادها. If لو, what's the meaning of if here, Daini? So there are three ifs in Arabic. So you know, you know, the 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 in either and لو is لو hypothetical possible. Or is it something that can happen? Huh? Lao in the Arabic means it cannot happen. It is only used in a hypothetical fashion. It is rhetorical. It is a rhetorical if. Unlike the either or in. 
if. But law means if as well, but it can never happen. Of course. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, even if my own daughter commits a crime, in this case, sarakat, uh, uh, steal something. In those days, you know. So the punishment is, you have to cut, you know, the hands are cut off. In those days. Sarakat, law kata'atu yadha. If she committed that, I myself will cut off her hands. Meaning here the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the lawgiver for the Sharia. Not just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the Sharia is also Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In this, we don't use the term shirik, by the way, but in this, there is a, both the Prophet of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we follow the guidance of the Prophet as well here. The Prophet himself says that he will implement the punishment himself. So this is where Bia mati anak, jangan mati adab is coming from. Can you imagine it? It's from the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is what Sultan Iskandar Muda was saying. Beautiful, isn't it? It's it's amazing that when we look back at Islam, the Malay Nusantara and the rule of law. So this is what, and I'm very glad that you gave. I mean, there's no in an Oxford tutorial. There's no right and wrong answer, so long as you can argue your case. And she actually said that. The one common, I ask her, what was the Hadul Ausat, the common denominator in Mantik? We learn Mantik, you know, Hadul, what is the common denominator? So I'm glad, okay, Zaka, when you fulfill Imam Shafi's first condition to be a good student of knowledge, quick witted. She said, oh, the Johorians, the first to put down their constitution. Okay, Alhamdulillah. I.e., true. The common denominator between Islam and the Nusantara and the, the rule of law here is basically constitutionalism. That whole idea of following the rule of law that is written down. So even though in our culture we do not write this down, biar mati anak jangan mati adat, because it's passed orally, but it's as good as writing it down, just like memorizing the Quran. Right? It's like memorizing the Quran. The Quran, when it was first transmitted, was not transmitted through the written pages. It was transmitted through the oral, through lisan. Right? Until the time of Sayyidina Uthman, anhu, when you have the Mus'haf. So this was like the period between the Mus'haf and the, the, the Qur'an, the Kalam Allah as uttered by the words of our, uh, through the tongue of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inspired by uh, uh, Angel Jibril Alaihi Wasallam. So this biar mati anak, jangan mati anak, is like, I don't want to say our Qur'an, but you know what I mean. You know, it, it's a truth. It is a qaida. It's not a pre It is a qaida there. But written down in the tongues of the Malays of this region that is passed on. And that is why, like in my country, in my state, in Perak, for example, or in the Greece Milan, for example, and in fact, in all the Malay rulers generally, there is a very long tradition of constitutional monarchy. Raja Berpelembagaan. Not Raja Mutla, not absolute rulers. Sorry, our Arab brothers here. So, no, some of them. So, you know, because the idea of an absolute ruler is very anathemical against not just the Malay culture, but Islam. As we saw from the Quran in Surah Nisa just now and from the Hadith of Urwa from Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim just now. The rule of law. So I can now go back to my Orientalist friends. This is what we do every day. You know, our friends. You know, I will not mention names. Name names. And it's the sort of sparring, fencing debates we, I have every day with, with Scholars who, of Islam who are not Muslims, who, you know, sometimes, yeah. So they're so proud of the Ma'ana Qatar, I said, well, there is an Islamic precedence here. Yeah? It's true. One can argue the Quran is much older than King John, right? Surely. And at least even those Orientalists who want to follow the madhab of um, Patricia Crone and, uh, and so and so forth, say that the Quran was not written down until about 100 years later or something like that. Or certainly the hadith, but at least the, the, that hadith, Bukhari and Muslim, at least is done what, in 200, 300 years before the time of King John. So this is the, you know, you know, the Prophet said that if my child commits a crime, I myself will punish her. This is Magna Carta. So let's stop playing with this upmanship game. <laughs> Truth can be universal in this case, of course, just so that, it, of course, we found it. And it is found, for example, in the case of Magna Carta in 1215, because the victors write their history in that sense. But we sometimes forget our own history, and we should be proud of that. So, alhamdulillah, that's all I really have to say 
exactly 9.15. So you know, I'm on a roll here, although we kind of started late, 10 minutes late, so you can give uh, uh, emergency time. What is it uh, called when you play football? Uh, injury time. Yeah, injury time of no more than 10 minutes you know, to wrap up if, I, if, you, if, if it's okay. And, 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 but really, really, I hope, you know, I mean, this is a joke. This is not a tutorial because you, you know, to technique tutorial, color Oxford tutorial, no more than three in one room, meaning three students, you know. Uh, so I, I always like to conduct singleton tutorials one to one. This is called Talaki, by the way, which the uh, <coughs> Oxford people stole from the, from the Muslim world. <laughs> you know, it's a Jedi master and Paduan relationship, you know. That's the Oxford system. So if it's more than three and you guys are more than three, we can't call it the tutorial anymore. Right? But I'm trying to give the spirit of the tutorial here, a bit, a bit of that, inshallah, so that you can see this is, this is really where it, 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 it all comes up. But I hope that we benefit from this, that we should be proud of our tradition, but only if you have ilm, only if you've actually kind of gone to the trouble to try and learn about it. And, and, and the whole point of having ilm as Imam Ghazali would say, Alim Amal, there's no point if you have knowledge and if you don't act on what you know. Right? And, and, and so this is not to put people down or anything like that. This is not to say, oh, we are better than the Westerners. No. And the reality is, is such that, you know, I mean, this is it's, it's, it's a truism. This is another truism. You know, people go to the West and they see these, these beautiful truths, if you like. Uh, meaning those who come from the Muslim world, and then they say, wow, you know, it's like, this, this is part of, you know, it's actually part of your religion. This is one of the sayings, by the way, of Imam Rifa'a Tahtawi al-Azhari, a very famous 19th century Azhari ulama in 1825 or 1826, uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha sent him to Paris. You know, he was sent to Paris, he was sent to, to Europe, and in those days, the Muslim world had to then, because they lost the ball, it's like playing the FIFA World Cup for a certain team that I always, I don't really watch football, but I watch football every four years and support a certain team that acts in a very similar way to the Malaysian national team. You know? So you get to a certain second round or whatever, quarterfinals, oh, real anticlimax. You know? Football is never coming home. You know? so, so it's really when you lose the ball, and you lose the game. And, and, and the Muslims had that ball. Once upon a time, in the first three, four hundred years of their history, the so-called golden age, right? And, and this, this was, that was when, when, when Muslim civilization was the first world, and Europe was the third world. So I, I jokingly say, and I think you've attended some of my lectures, I'm sure, that, you know, jokingly say to, to, to the undergraduates, that I could argue that there is, an in, you know, there, the history, there is an inverse relationship between Western history and Muslim history. Arguably, maybe today we are going through our dark ages. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've had our enlightenment earlier in our history, and now <laughs> we have to struggle against this. Why? Because we lost the ball. And, and Europe was in the dark ages there. But what made them transform themselves? It's things like this. The rule of law, which actually is something that came from the Muslim tradition that we should be very proud of. Yet we ourselves today forget this, you see. We neglect this to our detriment. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to us. He will punish us because we are the ones who basically do not act on what we know. It is as simple as that. And that's why Imam Rifa'a Tahtawi, you know, in the 19th century when we are already in the going through our zulumat, the real, you know, in one of our dark ages, if you like, when he went to, to Paris, what did he say? Zahabtu ila Faransa, zahabtu ila Paris, I went to the West and I saw Islam, meaning some form of truth there, but with no Muslims there. This is, by the way, a very uh, apocryphal, I would say, famous saying of Shohra, saying of Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. It's always attributed to this. But, and I've asked a number of the ulama, Azhari ulama, especially Egyptian ulama, where is the saying? You can't find it. So, but it's shuhra, it's like Maudu'a saying of Muhammad Abdul. Fine, it's a good saying. But I found this saying actually is written in his, in, in his uh, Al Ibris, his autobiography of Imam Tahtawi, who was alive.
you know, a generation before Muhammad Abdu. And he said it, and this is written by himself. I went to the West and I saw Islam with no Muslims. I went back to Egypt or Cairo or went back home. And I saw there are Muslims, but there's really no true Islam. <laughs> and this was a saying of Tahtawi, who was a famous jurist, I mean Shafi'i and Ash'ari and Sufi, alhamdulillah, and an and, and, and amazing experience. Eh? And of course, this became a very famous saying of Muhammad Abdu later on. So, what we find with the Ma'na Kata, therefore, we can proudly say, this is a universal truth. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created such, made takdir, right? It's called Magna Carta in Latin. In Sejarah Melayu, it's called Akad. So all I have to do is add Akad Kabir to it. Alhamdulillah. Orang Melayu kata, naik bulu Roma. Sorry, how do we translate that? Goosebumps. Al-insanu yudabbiru Allah yukaddiru. Man proposes, God disposes. There is a God after all. No joke, these are two different histories. The, the ishtima, the conjunction is between sejarah Melayu and sejarah Inggris. Yeah? Wow! Oh, if you don't believe me, go and check. You know? There is a God. And we know this is one of the universal truths to follow the rule of law. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not have declared it as such in the Quran, nor the Prophet. So, I finish here. So, Akulu Kauli Hadha, as they say. And may Allah forgive me, inshallah, uh, for any mistakes. And uh, uh, over to you. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Fifi, for this important reminder of actually, you know, understanding our own history. Because as you mentioned, that like, if we don't write it, it's the victors who will write it. Mm. And, and it's really important to actually understand that, you know, the idea of constitutionalism has its own Islamic precedence. And without, you know, necessarily always comparing it to kind of like, Eurocentric um, uh, notions of, of law, mm. and so um, I think it's important that you mentioned the fact that you know Sajjad Malay was uh, was written down, and this this is like as as one of the few Muslims in the Rand Institute, one of the Asian Middle East Institute. Um, I think there are more Muslims in the years below, but for example, like the, the idea, of the fact that you know it has to be written down, like literacy is measured by by the fact that you can you can write, you know, is something that is quite Eurocentric, and and the idea of literacy in the in the Muslim world is actually through orality, and so um, well, I guess this, I mean my question is not kind of related to that, but the idea that well, because I because I'm more in, I'm more familiar with the idea of the, um with the history of the late Ottoman Empire, but over here you know because rather than one Khilafah, we have you know several sultans and the states, and so what was the relationship between I guess administrating the law between the well, uh, I, I can think of this, in fact, uh, since you partly mentioned the Ottomans, uh, a very modern example of this would be in the history of Malayan independence itself. And not a lot of people actually know this. Um, of course, you know, the Abu Sultan uh, model here in the region of the Ottomans. So you may not realize that, but that is the case. And not just for this region in the Sultan, but also in Morocco, all over the Muslim world. Because the Sultan becomes not only the political leader of the country, you know, the executive in those days, the first estate, also the head of religion, the Nasiruddin, the defender of the faith. Actually, much like you find his Majesty King Charles now, Charles the Third, the Supreme Governor of the of the Church of England, for example, but he's also the you know the head of state. But we see this in Malaysia, especially interestingly, or of course, those countries have similar sultans like Jordan, for instance. Um, so, in in case of Malaysia, it's interesting because the sultans have have standard their executive powers. To, you know, to the to the polit political class, as it were. So they become, in my in my estimation, and if you know any political theory, you will understand it. Especially, especially American constitutionalism, the whole idea of the first, second, and third state. You know, the first estate is uh, the executive, the second estate is the legislature, the third estate is the judiciary, and they are all, as the Americans would say, they are co-equal. 
right? So they check and balance one another and so on and so forth. Okay. And it's interesting and they always, you know, this is the opportunity thing, and they always say that oh, because of this system they are in one of the top democratic countries in the world and so forth. But again, you know, in the Oxford and Kalam, if you like, spirit, which is really scholastic Islamic dialectical theology, just not Miyaka in Kajabi. But it's true, I really do use it. But it's a better system than the American presidential system of democracy. You see, they only have three estates. There are some countries in the world they have a zero estate. A zero estate. What well, we in Malaysia or in Malaya, Malayu or in Malay, we call Payung Negara, which are the rulers, basically, the ruler. That's the equivalent of zero estate. And Malaysia is not unique. England is like that. They have the king there. It's a constitutional monarchy. Why? Because the zero state, right? You know, the idea of the state comes from the French, not the Americans. You know, the, the, the French Revolution, the Astor Jara, you know, so the 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 bahagian bahagian negara, you know, the 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 bahagian bahagian the parts of the state. That's why the first estate is the executive, the prime minister, the executive, and the cabinet. You know? But even the first estate is appointed by the king. At least in England and in Malaysia. By Tongku Agung. Ke bawah dunia mahu dia, Sri Paduka baginda yang dipertuan agung. Just like His Majesty the King of England will appoint the Prime Minister. So that's why the first estate, although it's executive, the source of that is still the zero estate. The second estate is the legislature, the Houses of Parliament. So just like in England and here, it's the king that opens the parliament. Right? And the third estate is the ju ju judiciary, the, the, to be a judge. Just like in England and over here, it's the king that appoints the judges. So it is interesting, right? So I would make the argument, a very Oxford argument here, backed up by the economists, but if, you, know, you do hope that you get the chance, especially if there are ulama here, usta usta here, please read around your subjects. You know, so don't only read if you're a scholar of fiqh or usul, don't just read fiqh and usul. Obviously, you're an expert in fiqh, but you must read around the subjects. This is how the Muslims became great once upon a time. You know, become a mutafannin, a polymath. That's how we train our ulama so that they can come up with very good fatwas, inshallah. So they read about the dunya properly. One of the best sources of the dunya is a magazine called The Economist. And The Economist, you know, has a unit called the EIU, the Economist Intelligence Unit. And they always publish a yearly, annually, a democracy index, DI. And you can check the legal, not premiership. You know, a lot of us spend a lot of time this day. But have you checked the democracy index? The first top countries. If you look at the first 10 countries, Daini, the majority of the, the first five countries at least three of them or four of them, three of them are constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary democracy. Not a presidential system <laughs> like the United States. Even the US is not even listed under the first five, by the way. It's in the first top ten, but not first five. Why? Because my argument is, having read this and my tahlil, not tahlil, but yasin, but analysis of this, is a constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary democracy is a much stabler form of democracy than a presidential system. Because the argument in England is, we don't want Tony Blair to be our president. So whenever you want to throw away the king, we don't want. So we always go, and then we go back to being a royalist. So always the Republican women always come up, you know, some bark or something, and then you always give, you want Tony Blair to be your, your head of state? Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> MashaAllah. Raja Adil, Raja Disamba. Raja Zalim, Raja Disangah, MashaAllah. So, I mean, it's a truism, it's a qaeda. Just like biar mati anak, jangan mati adat just now. Amazing, isn't it? MashaAllah. Sidi, Alhamdulillah. The Junaid Mafia is here. So, you know, you know, these are the real royal families, you know. So, if they brought Islam to the region until the Kiamat, we are indebted to them. And may we never be arrogant in that. There are some of us who even speak bad of the Habaib and the Ba'alawi. La hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al You know. So, it is amazing that, and I would argue that a presidential, sorry, a, a, a constitutional monarchy democracy is a, is a stabler form of democracy than a presidential system. And that's why you see the, 
Economist Democracy Index, EIU, done, published by the Economist Intelligence Unit every year, shows at least the first top five are always, uh, you know, Norway, Sweden. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because, inshallah, you know, Malaysia has what Aristotle would say, the Bilkoa, the potential to become <laughs> top ten, or Bilkoa. I mean, I mean, so that you become Bilfail one day, actualize. Right? Because we have the right ingredients, just like England. England is, has, is a country with a zero estate. MashaAllah. You know, we have the first estate, second estate, third estate. And of course, there is the informal fourth estate, which is, does anybody know? You're from the, you're from the media. The fourth estate is, you know, TV3, somebody on TV3. So exactly, that's the fourth estate. All of this is to check and balance each other. Muhasaba. A very Islamic thing. You know, Imam al-Ghazali, one of the great Imam of the Muslims, you know, when he wrote his Nasihat al-Muluk, this is a, a, a genre of work which has become, you know, in English is known as the mirror for princes. It's become a genre in itself. And, you know, in German, Fugenspiegel and so on and so forth. So it, it's become a tradition in itself, right? But one of the things that Imam al-Ghazali says is true, you see, you have the ruler, and then those who are advising him, whether in this country we call them the opposition or not, you know, they are, in effect, performing the check and balancing role, which is what in Islam is called muhasaba. Sometimes, if you cannot do your own accounting, somebody needs to account for you. And it's like showing a mirror. Mirah. Imam al-Ghazali said, Miratul muluk. A mirror for the princess. And, and when you do that, with that intention, you actually get pahala, you get rewarded. So that's why His Majesty Sultan of Johor, in fact, uh, recently, I think, didn't they make the announcement in Johor that you know, he doesn't want the opposition that to be known as the opposition, pembangkang, tetapi apa? Pihak sema imbang or something like that. Alhamdulillah. You know. Because if the public doesn't understand this, is, they should understand the role. In a healthy democracy, you always have, you know, people on both sides will, will keep on changing power there. In Malaysia, we make dua that it become a more mature democracy, as I always say, not jokingly. 10, 15 years ago when I advised, you know, some of the rulers and so on and so forth, we need to see Malaysia to, have, to become a sawomatang country. <laughs> exactly. So that it doesn't matter which political party you may join, which party political party you may subscribe to. I don't, by the way, I cannot, you know. On the Bayon Negara side, we have to be seen to be neutral. Even if you love somebody or some party or something like that, you can never make it known. But you have to be sour matang so that even if you belong to different parties, you can still go to a kunduri of dinner together. And until that happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to change your condition, really. Until that happens. So you need to learn that when it comes to politics, it's not all or nothing. It's not be all and end all. It's not die all or kill them all or devil la all. No. Because at the end of the day in politics it's every almost every decision is subjective. Meaning the ishtihad is the decisions made by these politicians are ishtihadiya are subjective. So I have a qaeda my own by the way. Al Ahzabu Fisiyasa Okay, if somebody can translate that, you know. So, and this should be a qaeda, right? In the same way, we can have a double ikhtilaf among our fuqaha, in our Islam, in our religion. You know the famous saying, right, of Imam Shafi? Beautiful. This is one of the things that our Orientalist friends, you know, so they be, become enamored by this. You know, my, I have professors in my own faculty, in the, in the oldest faculty in Oxford, in faculty of theology. They tell me they are admired in Muslim civilization in the early years, of course, not today. You know, we have the enlightenment there. And I ask them, why do you say this? Oh, because of this, to live and that live quality that you've taught the world which people think is a British quality, to agree to disagree. This is all coming from Imam Shafi. I believe my opinion in my ishtihad when I did my PhD on the topic of whether we touch the opposite sex, whether it breaks the wudu or not, I, to break wudu, you know, even without no uh, 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 
Shahwa or something like that, you know. But of course, you know the the the, the Maliki position in the middle and all. You say, yeah, if Shahwa then Briggs would do, you know, the Hanafi is the most liberal on this. Of course, no Briggs would unless if there is some water that comes out, etc., etc. You see, it's all in the same scale, there, and we have our strong PhD uh, thesis to argue for this. So Imam Shafi says that Madhabi Sawabun Yahtamil Khata. You know, I believe my opinion in that ishtihad to be correct with the possibility of it being incorrect. Look at how humble the great Mushtahid Imam al Mutalibi. Allah Akbar. Wa Mazlun Akhar, meaning the opposite view, the opposing view of the view that is this view, the Hanafis, the Malikis, and the Hanbalis on this, to be incorrect, Yahtamilu Sawab, with the possibility of it being correct. Wow! So my faculty, my faculty, these are professors, you know, very serious. Some of them don't even believe in God. You know, they say, this is what we admire about Islam. For this to agree to disagree thing, you know. This is, wow, you guys can be so united because from a Christian perspective, and these are Christian scholars who are telling me, oh, if you are called Orthodox, coming from, you know, the Greek, in the Latin word, orthodoxa, ortho, correct, Sirat al Mustaqim, Doxa, Akida, Belief. So for them, if you are the right church, you are, that's it, nobody else can be right. Only they are the only right ones. That's why we have religious wars in the history of Christianity with Protestants and Catholics. It's relatively rare in Islam. The Sunni Shia fight only happened particularly in our history. I can ask that any when during the Safavi period in particular. No other times that we, do you actually have this. We did the Ottomans and the Safavi during, you know, 100, 100 years in, and that was beginning of our dark ages, if you like. So it, it's amazing that, so my friends are telling me, these are Christian professors, they tell me, people like Dermot McCullough who wrote this thick tome, A History of Christianity, you know, 800 pages or so, and say, this is what I admire about Islam. I said, then I said, Dermot, it, it, it's oxymoronic from a Christian standpoint. <laughs> Because for them, orthodoxy means only you can, only one madhab is right, and no other madhab can be right. If that madhab is right. Look at what Imam Shafi says. I believe my madhab to be correct on this question, on this masala, with the possibility of it being wrong, whereas the opposing view on this to be incorrect, but with the possibility of it being correct. Why? Because he was following the beautiful hadith and sunnah of the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Prophet said what? Al-Musibu, this is for the Mushtahid. We are, you know, who is a Mushtahid among us today? You know, Al-Mushtahid Al-Musibu, in the one who got the right answer, Lahu Ajran. The one who received the right answer in his or her PhD will get two rewards. Wal Muhtiu, and the one who got the wrong answer, Lahu Ajran Wahid. Still it will receive one point. Wow. So long as he's ikhlas or she is ikhlas in reaching the answer. Doing a munaza, doing a PhD thesis on this question, for example. The one who receive, who the one who achieves the right answer gets two points because why? One, obviously, for getting the right answer in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that we will know in the next world, not today, not in this dunya, but after we die. It's on the matters of furu, not on matters of usul, not on matters of fundamentals of our aqidah on theology. No, it's these are. Things that we can agree to disagree on. Sorry, Whether Shafifi on that note, on to agree or disagree. Um, now I would like to open the oh, floor. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Questions to the floor. <laughs> sure. If anyone would like to ask Thank a question. Thank you. This is the istishara from the students. <laughs> but you know, so in that particular case, when we realize that we can agree to disagree on this, this is really what Christians of the West realize. That's the sort of value that they really admire about the Muslim tradition. Because this is what the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a hadith which is Sahih, right? If you get the right answer, you get two real points. One for getting the right answer, the other for the effort. And the one who got the wrong answer still is rewarded by one point. But for his or her effort, so long as she or he is ikhlas, sincere in trying to find the answer. So that's why I say, Al-Ahzabu fi siyasa kal madhahib fil fiqaiho. Intishar, make da'wah of this. You know, uh, adjust <laughs> lakum. Adil qa'ida. 
party politics how do i translate that al hazabu fi the differences of opinion among the politicians among the party politics should be treated like the difference of opinion of the madahib in fiqh just as when when we go and pray uh, today or something like that and then you know some of us uh, in the shafi'i you hold your hands in certain position the hanafis in a certain position you don't bat an eyelid anymore you, it's okay you can agree to disagree on that that is how you should be able to be able to be in a position of to agree to disagree even in politics so given that we are in election season i'm glad that we have the opportunity to to release that so that when we become more mature as a nation then you know these are all matters of ishtihad not objective truth they are subjective truth and they are all competing for what musabaqah for what for maslah for what they interpret as the common good and that interpretation of the common good will of course differ from one man from one woman from one party to another party it is if you like the difference between in the madhab of shafi'i so if i'm teaching you know uh, the min uh, min the minhaj or the fath al muin fath al the difference between qaul asah and qaul sahih it's not about qaul sahih it's not about what is the right opinion versus the wrong opinion it's about what is the more correct opinion versus the less correct opinion both both are in a sense correct if we understand that we will be able to be much more civilized in our own political discourse there and this comes from our religion that we should be very proud of because the orientalists and people in the west are most proud of that uh, sorry if we open up to there was a lady i think uh, uh, raising hands or someone here anybody so i think we have two nights a lady so this is open to the floor now i think before we uh, uh, ah see daini there are no takers <laughs> yes thank you doctor uh, very enlightening tonight i sure. uh, just wanted to ask right uh, since uh, one of the things as a guy who's looking at how to improve society mm -hmm. uh, economic plays a pretty big factor right. mm -hmm. when it comes to politics right mm. so i'm just wondering right since uh, if you play politics uh, sometimes at the high level they always say that malaysian debt is 300 billion 600 billion and it's going to keep increasing right so when i look at it Uh, the more the country is in debt the more it is rich for example uh, america has 3 billion uh, 3 trillion in debt oh. and malaysia has about 600 700 tri billion i don't know how much for today but who is the richer country okay. i mean that's something you know i just wanted to get your perspective on this one All right okay well thank you um what's your name uh, fridos fridos thank you fridos uh, Well, I I have to disclaimer I'm not a mujtahid in politics so obviously I a you know won't be able to answer that uh, from a political standpoint in case if his question has a political subtext one particular party whether it is uh, apa, what what are the parties here perikatan versus what uh, the harapan whatever they you know so I, very clear disclaimer that and secondly I'm not an economist so clearly I it is this is completely out of my depth So I'm an anamukallid fi hadha sual so I'm a, a, a follower in this case but what I can say is this generally speaking I mean I by the way economic is not at all my subject so I really can't answer that question very clearly it does of course appear as if almost all of the countries in the world are in debt and so on and so forth it's an interesting question you know the richer you are the bigger your debt you know so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us especially in our homes household by the way The, when we use the term economics in Islam in Arabic it's called uh, tadbirul manzil which is the original word from economic comes from that to be able to manage your your own house interesting your own which is which is interesting now i hope that you're not having your credit card debts up to the hilt and all that etc you make dua but all i should say is this i think if any if there is any provide if there is any poverty in any society that society cannot be said to be truly islamic that's all i can say you know seriously why 
Because the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu anhu in Abu Dawud, for example, and others. In it, this is a beautiful du'a that the Prophet prays all the time. He says, "Allahumma inna na'udhika min al-faqri wal qillati wa dillati, wa na'udhika min al-nazlam or nazlim or nuzlam." Amazing du'a. Here, the Prophet, our Prophet, is thinking poverty and oppression. Listen to the Prophet's du'a. It's an amazing du'a. O oh Allah. Keep us away from fakr, from poverty, from kibbati, from hardship in life, from zillati, from living in humiliation. How do we translate this in Malay? Ya Allah, ya Tuhan kami, jauhkanlah kami daripada kemiskinan. Jauhkanlah kami daripada kesusahan dalam hidup. Killah, you know. And jauhkanlah kami daripada hidup dalam kehinaan. You know, the Prophet is connecting these three lowly maqam. If you like these three, you know, debasing makam, you know, you know, sufla makam sufla, right? This low makam with what? Wa naudz becoming an Muslim, an Muslim, and to keep us away from those who oppress others and becoming the one who is oppressed, meaning to Ya Allah, jauhkanlah kami daripada menindaskan orang lain dan jauhkanlah kami daripada jadi orang yang ditindas. How do I translate this more into Malay? Is it clear? That ya Allah, dan jauhkanlah kami daripada orang yang menganiaya orang lain dan jauhkanlah kami daripada orang yang kena anaya. So here, the Prophet of Allah SWT is actually linking justice with poverty. So I'm answering your question in a very general philosophical way. What I can do as an Ustaz. Sorry, I'm not a politician. I have no answers whether more debt is better for us or less debt is better. No. That is an an issue you need a you know mujtahid mutlaq in economics to prove it, and I suspect that is going to continue that debate. But what I can tell you from what the teachings of our religion is that there is a clear correlation between the upholding of justice and the emergence of poverty. Because if you do not uphold justice, yes, it will can lead to poverty. This is the very reason why Imam Imam Al Ghazali says, Al Adlu. Maksud syariat al-asil that justice is the original objective of the Sharia is the is the maksud al-asil you know how do you translate that is the yeah is the foundational objective is the foundational reason for why the Sharia why the law exists in the first place in order for us to uphold justice so this is why I mean Allah I mean you know that aside. If we don't have strong institutions in the country, and what I want to mention is one of the things I always in my sohbah with my Sultan, Tuanku Sultan Tera, Sultan Azim, for example, and you would notice in his speeches, in his tita, the importance of memperkasakan institusi dalam Melayu to strengthen our institutions. We do not want to have a one-man show. Those of us who come from the West, you know, Australia. The UK tonight and others, you know, I I have seen mosque committees, you know, or I've seen certain you know, organizations, certain Muslim institutions who are basically run by one-man shows. They are not institutional. They all die with their with their personalities. This is why we need to strengthen our institution. So, it's not a you know the answer is really not just the one factor thing. It's a multifactorial thing. So it's a very powerful thing, and then since we talked about this, now upholding of justice is interesting. This is the whole point of why we want to do this is because we want to have a thriving society, a sustainable society, a happy society. The joke is what now? Not joke. Sorry, I will keep. I will sound too political. I will not do. do I will not comment on that. So, but we want to achieve a thriving society. Whether you want to call it Madani or you want to call it. Uh, Hadari, or you want to call it uh, Wasati, or whether you want to call it, you know, Islamic, you know, even you want a thriving society. Apa thriving bahasa Melayu apa? Satu masyarakat yang berjaya, cermelang, yang thriving, you know, yang hidup, yang apa? 
progressive ya yeah, progressive mereka tu lompat jauh <laughs> i mean but but yang 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 but yang yang subur yang yang what berjaya saing you know wow you know so tonight is politics 101 right so uh, yang 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 uh, dayni help me here <laughs> She's from Oxford. She can't help me. Uh, but you know, young, young, you see, uh, yes, thriving. I, I really, until I get the right word, I will be okay. You know? <laughs> my, my, heart, not, the sakina has not reached my heart yet. Yeah. No, the, a thriving society. Young, young, self, young, young, sustainable. Huh? Berkembang maju. Young, young, confident with itself. Young, you know, yeah. Makmur, I think makmur. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So pahang lah dapat dia punya <laughs> dia, dia punya monopoli. Thank you, the Sahib Al Mokha. Yeah, makmur. You know, it, it, you, you get my point, right? Darul Salam, Darul Ridwan, Darul Makmur, Darul Taazim. You know, all these make that society thrive. For it to grow, Allah. You know that you are not tak dikongkong tak. You go organically. That's the idea. Now that is the ultimate aim. To achieve that, you have to have justice. Otherwise, you will not get. Why? Because if you have a thriving society, is when you don't have poverty anymore. This is the point. That's the highest aim. In order to achieve that, you have to have justice. As Imam Ghazali says, "Al-Adlu, Maqsud al-Asil Sharia." Amazing, amazing. Now, in order to achieve justice, what do you think we need to have? What we talked about tonight. Upholding the And you know what? One of the you know this is amazing. It's absolutely true. I mean, this is all tutorial in life. <laughs> During our merdeka, the Agong, the first king of Malaysia, was Tuanku Abdul Rahman, and this is one of the one of the history baraka of Malaysia. Uh, sorry, the rest of the other countries in the world, <laughs> Malaysia. Is Uniquely blessed in this respect, the first head of state and the first head of government share the same name, name. Abdul Rahman. His Majesty Duliang Mahmudia Tongku Agong Abdul Rahman, Tuanku Abdul Rahman, and the Prime Minister was Yang Ahmad Mulia Tengku, not Tuanku Abdul Rahman. One from Kedah, the other one from Negeri Sembilan. The first King of Malaysia was from Negeri Sembilan, right? And that's why there is a school in Ipoh in Perak. Uh, my state called stars. Sekolah Tuanku Abdul Rahman, not Tengku Abdul Rahman. People sometimes think it's, it's the first prime minister's name. No, it's Tuanku Abdul Rahman, the first king. He was named after the first king. And therefore, because the first king was from the Bismillah, the mufti who read the dua at the launan of Merdeka, you know, Merdeka, the morning of Merdeka, was the mufti of the Bismillah, Sheikh Ahmad Said, great Sufi, a great alim. A great scholar, a great ulama, mashallah. And his dua, do you know his dua? He started his dua. He said, "Allahumma wafiq." This is the first line of his dua. Allahumma wafiq. Sa'ir al ummal, wal wazara, wal muluk, wal salatin, wal umara. Li riyati umuridin. His first line was to Allah, give success to the ummal, to the civil servant. To the bureaucrats, to the pengawat awam, to the pekerja, orang, bukan raja, not the king, not the politicians, not the ministers. This is this is a great sheikh, mufti from Darul Khusus. Allah mawafi, sayur orang, give success to the civil servants. Why? Because they are supposed to be the arbiter of a nation, the in people who are neutral politically. They neither support this side or that side. They neither support if you're in England, Labour or Tory or uh, what is it? Give them, say Liberal. Okay. Neither Barisan National nor Pakatan. Nor, they are supposed to be completely independent. Allahumma wafiq sa'ir al ummal wal wuzara and the advisers to the you know to to the to the to the ruler, whatever the ministers, the prime minister, the politicians, wal muluk wal salatin and the raja raja and the sultans, the our leaders. To what? Liriati umuridin. In order to uphold. In order to what? To take care of the affairs of the believers, the Muslims, right? And then he goes on to say, why? Why kamatil adli bil akam? 
and to uphold the rule of law dan untuk menegakkan kedaulatan undang-undang because if you don't uphold the rule of law there is no justice look he's saying in arabic wa iqamatul adli fil ahkam this is a very nice saying in arabic which is a wadi min malaysia mashallah min malaya not from the arabic country is it here we have some arab brothers here this evening so wa iqamatul adli fil ahkam which is unique so to iqamat not iqamatu salat but to establish not salat but to establish justice through what through the law through kedaulatan undang-undang so without the rule of law you cannot achieve justice and i would just end here we in order for us to have the rule of law there's no way the country can succeed if you don't have government we talked about perkasa kan institusi you need to have good governance uh, how you see good governance in malay uh tabi sini tak saya buat sini tak boleh English in Malay. This is very really good. Senang untuk cakap bahasa Melayu. So I'm just joking. Tadbi urus yang baik. Because only with tadbi urus yang baik, can we then have the, the whole point of having tadbi uh, urus yang baik is to make sure we follow the systems in place, the laws or the whatever protocol you put in your company or whatever it is, right? Now, can you imagine it? I, I would f- just finish off with this. So I think, yeah, it's now ten. I will finish off with this. <laughs> I, imagine, here we have the f- most foremost political scientist out there, Francis Fukuyama. You know, Cambridge, Mass. Not even Cambridge, the other place. Harvard, right? The other, you know, you know, not even the other place. Out, out, out of, out, out, you know, another country. You know, out of out of the pond. Francis Fukuyama said that. This is too simple. Number one, the capability of the governing body, the core of the state, the capability of that organization. So whatever your organization is doing, your company, your country, to project power, basically. That's number one. The core. And number two, the bureaucrat's autonomy, the independence. What does he mean by that? And if you read Fukuyama in this, he means by that that you have to be independent. That means you're neutral. That means you know, like the civil servant, you know, that the ability to muhasaba, like Imam Al Ghazali says, mira for the muluk, to show a mirror in front of you to so see, I, I am the CEO of the company. Am I doing something right? If I'm, if I cannot hold the mirror myself, muhasaba, I need somebody to remind me, not my just my opposition, somebody who can check and balance on me, my auditor, for example. And so on and so forth. So this is what Fuku- Francis Fukuyama is saying. Whether Francis Fukuyama, that famous Harvard professor, realizes it or not, he was actually following, you know what? The mosaic criteria, the criteria of Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran in Surah Al Qasas, Inna, what is it? Manista jarta al khair. Inna inna khaira manista jarta al qawila. The best person whom you could employ, this is the famous story of Musa alayhi salam, right? Is Al Qawi, the one who is professional, the one who has the skill set, the right skill set, and the one who is Al Amin, Amana, the one who is trustworthy, meaning the one who is truly independent, who can give you good advice, a brotherly, sisterly advice, when you are doing something that is wrong, who becomes that mirror according to Imam Ali. You are doing something wrong there, you know, friend. So that's what the opposition is supposed to be doing with the government, for example. But fight on policies, not on ad hominem, not on personal issues, not you know, stop slinging the mud, start maturing. Come on, you guys are forty years old, you know, fifty years old, whatever it is, you know. Stop playing like you're in the playground. We need to focus on the issues, the the ishtihadi issues, like Firdaus, brother Firdaus saying, is it good to have that or not? There's an there's an Oxford argument there. There's an argument for it's good to have that, and there's an argument for not good to have that. <laughs> it, it, both ishtihad are what? Al, there's musib and mukti. Yep. You can be both right and wrong, but argue your case, show your argument. So, 
in a high manis tak jar kan kau ialah min sadaqallahu azim amazing this is the quranic criteria so francis kuyama is he the one who wrote or he's not not samuel huntington of course clash of civilizations and his friend by the way so he's passed away now i think is it so I, I, you know someone should, could have made dawah to him and said look this is the what you said is from you know this is the mosaic criteria from the quran mashallah so when you have tadbir rules yang baik you have good governance it will lead to that upholding the rule of law when you uphold the rule of law it will lead to you upholding justice only when you uphold justice is really when you can ensure where there is minimal poverty because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam linked both poverty and justice in that beautiful dua from abu daud from abu huraira mashallah so i think is it okay to close off or is it yes or oh my god oh, we are okay oh you want to close Okay. This is very good. Tak bi urus yang baik. I am glad, you know, because I did say ten is ten. This is the Abdul Rahman, you know. Alhamdulillah. So yeah, mashallah. So so I I will then. I mean, I'm sure I, we can have more informal sohbah after this. But I really am grateful, uh, Sayyid Abdul Rahman Al Junaid, for inviting me tonight. I can see the difference between the invitation of Habib Ali uh, Zain Al Abidin Al Hamid the other day when I went to uh, Taufiq, which is the which is the uh, what do you call the, the yeah the traditional majlis. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, this one I also love this one. I can let my hair down a bit, and we can really do a bit of a tutorial there. So, and I hope that you know when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say Inna ma laqalu bin niyad wa inna ma likuli imri ma nawa. Every action that we do is always based on an intention that we need to put meaning into our amal, right? That every man and woman will get what he or she intended. So I hope that the Sahib al Majlis had this, got what he or she uh, he in this case of course intended by inviting me here. And so from the title that you set for me, I hope that I have. Answered your tutorial, inshallah. So I will end, inshallah, with a short du'a as is customary in my majlis to ask Allah subhanahu wa taala for blessings, inshallah, for this this majlis, inshallah, particularly to this blessed month of Muharram in this new year of 1445, and that we've just passed through Ashura, mashallah, and then to ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bless, mashallah, mukhaba. Alhamdulillah, oh, mukhaba. Sorry, this is almost du'a now, but uh, I, it sounded like the Malay College Kuala Kangsar's alumni organization uh, called Mukba or something like that. But mukhaba, right? Yeah. But but no, this is mukhaba that we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, inshallah, to to give us uh, a knowledge that will free us, uh, that will free our minds, so that we can truly worship Allah in the way He ought to be worshipped, that He befits to be worshipped. That we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to keep us from knowledge that is of useless from us, you know, to keep us from knowledge that will distract us. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbal Alamin, Barikillahumma lana fi shahri Muharram. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbal Alamin, fi amin jadid. Wa adahulahumma alaina sinin dan baada sinin. Wa naudzuka min ilmin la yanfa. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbal Alamin. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to not give us knowledge that will be a hujjah against us in the next world, but instead to Aid us, to support us, to to give, to 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 be friends with us in the next world. Allahumma la tasira alma na hujatan alayna ya Allah. Ya Allah, fi yawm al kiyama, wa wa you know alma you know sara you know hujatan lana ya Allah. Ya Allah, al kiyama bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. And ya Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to give us, ya Allah, a knowledge of the things that we. That are, that are, you know, that uh, you know, it, it teach, give us, give us sabr with regards to the things that we cannot control, and to give us muwafak um, and taufik and courage for us to change the things that we can control, to teach us the true meaning of tarkumala yani as taught by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to give us the wisdom to distinguish between the things that we can change and the things that we cannot change. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bless all of our. Majlis, inshallah, and our parents especially to forgive us our sins. We are all sinful creatures, ya Allah. Please forgive us our sins. We have been created al insan mahal khata'ban nisyan to make mistakes, 
zaluman ya Allah and 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 to forget ya Allah but please forgive us ya Allah bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin we turn back to you ya Allah in tawbah ya Allah we forgive us our sins ya Allah Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna wa walidina wa ikhwanana wa liman habbana fika wa liman ahsana ilaina wa liman kana lahu haqqun alaina wa li muallimina wa li mashayikhina wa li jami'i almuslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'i wal amwat innaka kulibun mujibu da'wan bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin wa na'udhu bika min shururi an nas wa min shururi ahli zaman allahumma astir awratina wa min amin rawatina ya allah rabbal alamin wa sallallahu ala sayidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ala ra'sani ya abi bakar wa umar wa uthman wa ali radiyallahu anhum wa ajma'in wa ala al-arba'ati al-imam al-mujtahidin la siyama imamin al-shafi'i wa muqallidin fi al-din wa al-ulama al-amilin wa al-fuqaha'i al-muhadithin wa al-qura'i al-mufassirin wa al-sadati sufiyati al-muhaqqiqin wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsani ila yawmidin and lastly ya allah Please give us the ability for us to follow the beautiful sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sunnah baginda yang zahir dan juga yang batin. Sunnah baginda yang tersirat bahkan juga yang tersirat ya Allah ya Rabbal alamin supaya kami dijauhkan daripada ajaran-ajaran sesat. Minamudallin middillin wa tanlah bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin warzukna kamal almutaba'ati lahu zahiran wa batin wa salama wa afia. والحمد لله رب العالمين على هذه النية شأن لله لوم الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين هذه الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين رب في لنا ولوالدينا آمين تقبل الله ومنكم Oh, what is her name? Sharifah Rogaya Asagaf binti binti Syed Ahmad Asagaf. Sharifah Rogaya Asagaf. Al Fatiha ta ila ruh man ishtamana hawna bi sababihim kwa khususan ila ruh al marhuma Sharifah Rogaya Asagaf binti Syed Ahmad Asagaf wa usuliha wa furu'iha wa man yantasibu ilaiha ajma'in anna Allah yu'li darajataha fil jannah wa anna Allah yukathiru mathubataha wa yudu'afu hasanataha wa yaja'aluna min hizbiha wa yanfa'una biha wa bi'ulumiha wa asrariha fil din wa dunia wal akhira shay'un lillahi lahumul fatiha a'udhu billahi minal shaytanir rajim bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin arrahmanir rahim maliki yawmid din iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ina surat al-mustaqim wa surat al-ladina an'amta 'alayhim wa ghayri ma'dhubi 'alayhim qul inni rabbi fi lana wa li walidina amin taqabbal Allah wa minkum wallahu ta'ala alam bi sawab any mistakes are from mine and forgive me insha'Allah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thank you so much Dr Fifi for the um like an example tutorial of Oxford thank you to Dayini as well for moderating uh, this little announcement from uh, our organizer peace meal um, if uh, thank you everyone for coming, and if you like our events, uh, do support us uh, by buying our books. We'll fund the free events. And lastly, Al uh, Fatiha for uh, one of the peacemaker founders, mother-in-law, Sheikh Farouk Gayah bin Tahmal Sagaf. Bismillah Al Fatiha.